Welcome back, everyone, to Asian Art. Today we're going to continue to talk about ancient China. This uh, picture here in the center is an ancient Chinese coin. If you recall from our last lecture, it vaguely resembles what they carved out of jade as a bee disc. Notice the square in the center is symbolic of the idea of the earth, and the circle of the coin represents the sky. So like a bee disc, ancient Chinese coins reflected this idea of fertility and prosperity. Out of the Warring States period, a emperor emerged, Qin Shi Huangdi who would rule over the Qin dynasty, and he would pose extraordinary rules and restrictions on everyone he came to rule. The Qin dynasty was fairly brief by Chinese standards, but it was an intense organizing and expanding power that brought everything into a kind of unified system that would hold sway for thousands of years. Qin Shi Huangdi imposed very serious punishments for anyone who did not follow his rules. He unified all the laws under his domain. He created unity of currency, roads and axle widths, written language, and many other aspects besides. This is a way in which he was able to create a kind of unified country that expanded out to fairly close to modern Chinese borders today. You see here his central city of Chang'an or Xi'an was the place where he was sort of deep into the back country of China, close to the origins of this trade route that extended out to the Middle East. And from there, he would build roads that spread out across his kingdom with these very specialized grooves that only his vehicles could ride on. He also was very um, controlling over the populace in conscripting them into these massive projects, one of which is famous today as the Great Wall of China. The Great Wall of China as we see it today is actually mostly an edifice that was created much later in the Ming Dynasty, but the general outline of it and the, the structure of it was established way back in the Qin Dynasty. It is an imposing 4,163 miles long. Here you can see uh, the battlements that rise up where watchtowers can keep track on the very mountainous regions in northern China, which were meant to keep the barbarians out from invading and created some stability in the kingdom of China. It also had another very important psychological effect. It helped define the northern boundaries of China, that anyone south of the Great Wall could be taxed by the emperor. The history of the Great Wall of China is not one that does not include a great deal of controversy. There are stories um, of the terrible human costs of building this giant edifice. Meng Jiangu uh, is the story of a woman whose husband was scripted into the wall to work on building the wall and maintaining it. And when he did not return from his labor, she went out and searched for him, and she traveled the length of the wall searching for him, only to learn that he had been dyed and thrown into the wall and been buried inside the wall, like many, many people who had worked on the wall. It was essentially a sentence of death. Meng Jianlu was so distraught that she broke down and cried, and her cries were so strong and powerful that many miles of the wall collapsed around her. 
Hence the name in China that people often use to refer to this place is the Wall of Tears because it reminds people of the huge cost of its construction and maintenance. Very small portions of the wall actually look as nice as you see in this picture. Most of the wall is in a terrible and dilapidated state and it has uh, been poorly maintained because of the extraordinary cost, but also because of a sense of, of the ambivalence to this imperial past that conscripted and punished people so brutally in its construction. Another major project undertaken by the Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi was his, his burial ground, which was created and formed by this massive terracotta army buried deep underground. This terracotta army, which is a part of his burial tomb, was discovered in 1976 quite by accident as some villagers were digging a well. They came up and discovered a ceramic head. It was until the 1980s that serious archaeological digs began and then at that point they realized they had uncovered this massive tomb. It is the largest archaeological dig anywhere in the world. An estimated 7,000 larger-than-life warriors are buried through a series of trenches. They were not meant to be viewed. They were never meant to be seen. They were placed underground as a part of the emperor's tomb, preserving for all time, the, a replica of his actual army. Here you can see the tomb as it appears today and a kind of plan view to give you an idea of this extraordinary scale of what 7,000 soldiers approximately looks like. They don't know the exact number because uh, they haven't completely uncovered the whole thing. They have been working tirelessly since the 1980s to uncover and uh, reassemble this massive ceramic army. The army in its initial assumption was intended to create a replica of his living army because prior to this time it was the tradition that the, the emperor might actually kill some of his elite soldiers and generals as a way of bringing them into the afterlife when he died. In this case, by building this massive replica, he earned the undying loyalty of his living army because they knew he was not going to sacrifice them on his death. If we look at the tomb, of the terracotta soldiers. You can see it's only a small part of this massive necropolis that makes up the emperor's tomb. The terracotta figures are off to one part, and then there is this massive pyramidal tomb that uh, overshadows the whole site. They have not yet begun to uncover this tomb. They are slowly analyzing it with sonic um, and surveys to try and discern what may be inside. They are concerned for the safety of the objects within and even possibly the safety of the people who uncover it. There is stories that inside Qin Chi Wangdi's tomb is a replica of his entire empire with rivers and lakes made of real, real mercury. So, they also may be booby-trapped. In any case, let's take a look back at these soldiers that populate the terracotta figure T automobiles. You can see here that uh, component parts of the figures were built in clay and attached together and placed on a base then individual artists would come in and sculpt the details and provide um, the necessary individuals, individualization of the facial features and the hairstyles. 
And then lastly, it would be fired in a pit in, in sets, and then it would be brought into, um, into place. We know a fair amount about the construction because everyone who worked on various parts, the teams that worked on these would inscribe their names. And so there was a kind of product liability that people were expected to maintain high standards or they may be punished. Here's a close-up of one of the soldiers. You notice the extraordinary detail in the facial features, the ears, the hairstyles. It really is very much like an individual. And then many people have decided that it was very likely there were specific soldiers, especially higher ranking soldiers, that may have been these features modeled on. We can see that the hairstyles uh, represent uh, peoples of different cultures from throughout the Chinese Empire, ruled over by Qin Shi Huangdi. Over here on the right, we actually see the body, the larger than life-size body of an acrobat that was in an, a different tomb. I show you this here because I want to impress you with the incredible naturalism that they were capable of at this time. It's something that is something of a mystery because artists after this do not use any kind of naturalism to this degree. The Han Dynasty, the Qin Dynasty, was a brutal and short dynasty. Qin Shi Huangdi demanded so much from his people and he, the people of China lived in terror from his edicts and his passions. Uh, there was an attempted assassination on his life, and this scene is from the later dynasty, the Han Dynasty, showing Qin Shi Huangdi barely escaping his, his own death as assassins attack him. This scene is shown in the Han Dynasty because they were very critical of what befell the Qin. The Qin dynasty descended into chaos after the death of Qin Shi Huangdi. His son was unable to keep the kingdom together, and a peasant rebellion overthrew everything. This is why the Terracotta army is such a dilapidated state, because the rebellious peasants came in and broke into the tomb, hoping to find some of the actual weapons that who were on the terracotta soldiers. A fire broke out in the terracotta tomb and the roof collapsed on top of the soldiers and the people invading. This failure of the Qin dynasty to maintain prosperity and secure peace was a an idea that the people commonly believed was a sense of a loss of the mandate of heaven, loss of Tianming. And in this way, when a ruler who is considered to be the highest and closest representative of people to the gods, if they lose, the emperor loses this mandate of heaven, it is the responsibility of the people to overthrow this rule. And this is a very powerful idea that continues to resurface in Chinese history for thousands of years, that the people are willing to be led, even willing to be led under absolute rule with minimal rights, as long as the emperor can secure prosperity, peace, and stability. And the loss of that peace and stability is often taken as a sign of the loss of the mandate of heaven. After the Qin dynasty, the Han dynasty quickly moved to eradicate and vilify all aspects of the Qin dynasty that came before it. They moved away from the very highly realized art and they moved towards smaller, more stylized, figurative representations. Militaristic displays of power were frowned upon, and the tomb sculptures became much smaller, more doll-like figures, until they eventually all disappeared. And instead of showing military power, 
people, when they were buried, wanted to show ceramic effigies of their wealth and their prestige and their artistic tastes. The Han Dynasty also introduced a number of important things we will talk about in length a little bit later. The imperial examination, where scholar people began to be tested on Confucian scholarship. The invention of paper, which deepened and broadened the bureaucratic powers. And the invention of porcelain, which created an incredible amount of wealth for the Chinese government. The Han Dynasty is also known for its expansion of silk trade and uh, its exquisite use of silk in all manner of textiles. Here you see um, a very lovely set of elite mittens made of several different kinds of woven silk threads. Silk is a very unique fiber that is made from the silkworm as it builds its cocoon. Dropping the cocoon in hot water dissolves the binder that kind of keeps the threads together in its cocoon shape. And then by carefully teasing out the end of the silk thread, they're able to draw out the threads of the silkworm and weave it into this incredibly durable and long-lasting uh, fabric. These silk mittens are 2,000 years old. Very few fibers can survive that long or even remain color fast the way silk can. Silk was a highly prized textile. It was desired all over the Mediterranean and as far away as Africa and Egypt. The Greeks and Romans both loved their silk and they went to great lengths to trade the Chinese for it for they had the exclusive technology for making silk. The Silk Road becomes this very powerful and valuable resource, though it's a treacherous journey across the deserts and the mountains over to the prosperous Mediterranean. It was one that proved an important lifeline to the Chinese and allowed them to advance and create an enormously pop, uh, prosperous and stable society. The imperial exam was a very interesting development in the Han Dynasty. It was a way for anybody, according to its precept, to take this an exam which showed that they were highly literate and skilled in the philosophy of Confucianism. This was an incredibly difficult exam. And even though it was open to anyone to take, only those people who could really afford private tutors rarely did very well on this very specialized knowledge of, in the imperial exam. But it meant that those who passed and entered into government service were some of the highest educated and some of the most uh, highly cultured people in China it became uh, an important a cultural signifier if you were accepted into the ranks of the literati elite of the Confucian scholars who made up the Chinese bureaucracy. Pressures to do well on this exam, of course, flourished and people felt a desperate need to cheat. That is what you see here in this handkerchief with its minutely written Chinese script this silk handkerchief with all its texts would have been folded discreetly into someone's clothing and pulled out during the exam to help them do better. The amount of information that is contained on this handkerchief is indicative of the high demand that people had for knowledge about Confucian scholarship and Confucian learning.